a Jewish family just arrived at the temple. It was a long journey, four days. They were exhausted, but they made it. And they had their lamb in hand. As they got to the temple courtyard, the father hands took the lamb and hand, hands the lamb over to the priest. Then the priest, with a razor-sharp knife, makes one quick cut to the throat, causing instant death to the lamb. Another priest right near, standing next to the father and the other priest, is standing there with a golden bowl right there to catch the blood that would flow through and flow out of the lamb. And as he catches the blood that comes out from the lamb, he then hands the golden bowl then to another priest and then to another priest and to another priest, all the way passing the golden bowl all the way to the last priest that's standing next, next to the altar. And then that priest, upon receiving that golden bowl with the blood of the sacrificial lamb, he pours forth that blood all over the altar. Then the dead lamb was was is is hung up on hooks with its two forearms spread out so that it could be skinned and then prepared for roasting. The family then took the lamb, their lamb home, roasted it and ate the lamb. Any Jewish family would do that every year. You might say, well, that's awfully weird, that's bizarre. But of course, no Jew would see it as weird or bizarre. Because when they saw the blood being poured forth out by the priest on the altar, and when they saw that the lamb was brought home and the lamb, the lamb was eaten, they would remember that night when death was coming for them. That eerie night that just reeked of death that we hear about in our first reading from the book of Exodus. When they saw those things happen at the temple courtyard and the blood being passed from one priest to another and ultimately the blood being poured on the altar and then when they brought the roasted lamb home and they ate, and they ate the lamb, they would remember that it was slaughtering the lamb that night, that eerie night, back in Egypt, and it was pouring forth the blood of the lamb and posting that blood on the doorposts and then eating the lamb, that if they did that, death would then pass them over that night, that eerie night when death was in the air, and that God would save them. If they killed the lamb, poured the blood of the lamb out on the doorpost, and then consumed the lamb, God would save them. God saved them by the blood of the lamb and then eating it. And then the instructions were to do it as a memorial every year to remember their liberation, to remember their restoration, to remember their de deliverance from slavery and Pharaoh. Jesus was no foreigner to this. He did it as a little boy. You could say he probably did it 33 times every year. We know, of course, he went, traveled with Mary and Joseph. It might have been him with this story in the very beginning of a family traveling four days. Probably would have took Joseph, Mary, and Jesus four days traveling from Nazareth down to the temple in Jerusalem. But it, we hear in our gospel today of the reading Jesus at the Last Supper. The night before he was betrayed, or the night he was betrayed, he gathered his disciples to celebrate the Passover meal again like he would any other time, as all Jews did. The bread was there, the wine was there, there's mention of the bread, there's mention of the wine, but there's no mention of the lamb. You can't have a Passover meal without the lamb. It's like sitting down for a Thanksgiving dinner without the turkey. I guess you could have Thanksgiving dinner without the turkey, but you'd be weird. It'd be weird. So it's worse than that because you could have Thanksgiving dinner without the turkey, but you can't have a Passover meal without the lamb. So the disciples, you can just imagine the conversations in, in the mind of the disciples, maybe whispering to one another at the Passover meal there with Jesus in the upper room, who brought the lamb to the temple the other day, yesterday? 
You know, the lamb that, remember, that gets handed over to the priest, the priest who has a razor sharp knife, who makes one quick cut to the throat, causing instant death to the lamb. You know, and then the, that other priest that's there with the golden bowl that catches the blood of the lamb and it's hand. Did, did, did anybody here see that? Did anybody take the lamb and get the lamb and take it there and to see all that happen? John, did you do it? Thomas, did you see it? Peter, certainly you took care of it. Before they could figure out who dropped the ball by not getting the lamb, they hear Jesus say, take this, all of you, and eat of it. This is my body, which will be given up for you. Sacrificial language. But why is he using sacrificial language? And then he says, take this, all of you, and drink from it. For this is the chalice of my blood, the blood of the new and eternal covenant, which will be poured out for you and for many for the forgiveness of sins. Sacrificial language again, being poured out, offered up. This is sacrifice language. There's no lamb. That's weird enough. And now he's using language and words that aren't part of the Passover script. It's not part of the ritual. Of course, it wasn't until the next day, Good Friday, that they realized that it wasn't that the lamb was forgotten, but that the next day, Good Friday, that he, Jesus, would become the sacrificial lamb, that he would give up his body, and it was his blood that would be poured forth upon the altar of the cross as atonement for sins, that blood that was poured out that reconciles us now at last, finally, because the book of Hebrews says, and elsewhere in the New Testament, blood of goats and bulls wouldn't cut it. The blood of goats and bulls could not take away sins. But the blood that poured forth from the cross, from the Son of God, was the sacrificial, the sacrificial blood that could finally atone for sins. With that, I wanna draw your attention. You should have received a little uh, card when you walked into church this morning. It's, it's a famous painting of the Adoration of the Mystic Lamb. It was painted in the 15th century by Jan von Eck. And it's currently resides in, the, in a cathedral in Belgium. We'd be here all day if I pointed to even some of, or some of these um, things in this painting, but I just wanna draw your attention to a couple. You notice at the, center of all, at the center of all of it is an altar. Much like that stands in the center of this church every day when we walk in, there's an altar surrounded by angels, angels waving thurifers and incense coming out, much like what will be here in, in a little bit. And everything and everyone's eyes are focused on the lamb who stands on top of the altar. The lamb, then you can see in the bottom left corner or the, or the bottom right there, the lamb bleeds from a wound in his side and streams of blood flows out directly into a chalice that's set on the altar. You can see the inscription on the altar on the bottom right image there. It's in Latin. It's hard to see here in this image, but that inscription in Latin reads in Latin, behold the lamb of God. Behold this lamb who takes away the sins of the world. And that's why tonight at this mass, at every mass, I will hold up the host and say, behold the lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. Blessed are those called to the supper of the lamb. And then we're invited to consume the Passover lamb. The same lamb that was sacrificed on the altar of the cross 2000 years ago. It's not a different sacrifice. It's not another sacrifice. It's the same sacrifice that's represented on this altar. And as tonight, as we 
celebrate the institution of the Eucharist, we also celebrate the institution of the priesthood. You know, as a pastor, a pastor, I guess, has to wear a lot of different hats, you know, running a, running a, a church and running a school. You know, behind the scenes, it can be difficult. Not can be, it is difficult. It, it, can, it can be complicated. You know, and there's been, there's been many times the last two and a half years that I've been here as, as your pastor, many times, whether it's not sure on how to proceed with something, you know, or just, or ju just facing a rough patch with regards to leadership and being a pastor, Whenever I get in a bad spot, and even, even at times when I'm reeling, and some people in this church know this, my, you know, my leadership team is here this evening. Some of you, you know, he maybe hear this spewed out sometimes at daily mass, but at times when I'm struggling and I'm reeling, there's one spot I go that things just get cleared up. Things, things fade away, at least, at least even for, for, for a moment. And it's when I stand right here. When I stand right here at the altar, things become clear. Because it's a reminder, it's a right, reminder of me being ordained a priest, being ordained in persona Christi, which means being, being ordained in the person of Christ, to act in the person of Christ. That is to say, Ordained, my life is about sacrificing for you. My life is about laying it down for you to serve you. You know, on, on Wednesday, this past Wednesday or every Wednesday, we have adoration where the monstrance and the Lord is placed on the altar and throughout the day, the school kids come in. At one point, I was in the back of the church praying before the Blessed Sacrament. And I think it was a fourth grade class came in and they're all kind of lined up over here. And I, when I looked up, I saw 20, what, nine-year-olds just kneeling right here with their eyes fixated on the altar or more so who was on the altar, the lamb that was on the altar. And their eyes were just beholding the lamb. And as I sat there in the back of the church, I just found myself, just, just I started to cry. Just being hearing the Lord say, Mark, thank you for being their father. Thanks for just putting me before them. Putting me before them, allowing them an opportunity just to behold me. You know, one of my, one of my favorite descriptions of the priesthood was written by a Dominican priest, and in fact, it's um, when priests get ordained, when I got ordained, and when priests get ordained on the back, they usually make a holy card. And on the back of the holy card, they can put a number of different things on there. I had an image on the front and on the back. I, had, I put this, this, this prayer or this poem, if you will, on the back of the holy card, which is on the back of this card, which I just want to read to, to conclude. It says, to live in the, the priesthood, to live in the midst of the world without wishing its pleasures, to be a member of each family, yet belonging to none, to share all suffering, to penetrate all secrets, to heal all wounds, to go from, to go from men to God and to offer him their prayers, to return from God to men, to bring pardon and hope, to have a heart of fire for charity, and a heart of bronze for chastity, to teach and to pardon, console and bless. My God, what a life, and it is yours, O priest of Jesus Christ. On this night, we give thanks to God. We give thanks to God for the Eucharist. We give thanks to God for the priesthood. Blessed are we who are called to the supper of the Lamb.